Woodruff, who is currently at IBM Elmaden, um, and he's going to talk about how robust our linear sketches. Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, the talk is How Robust for Linear Sketches to Adaptive Inputs. This is joint work with Moritz Hart. Okay, so this talk is going to cover uh, two aspects of coping with big data. Uh, the first is a standard efficiency aspect. Um, you want to design algorithms to handle enormous inputs. So you want the usual guarantees of uh, very low memory, very fast processing time, uh, etc. But we're also going to look at a, a robustness condition, um, meaning that uh, the algorithm can handle adverse conditions. And more specifically for this talk, what we're going to have is um, the inputs may be chosen to try to break the algorithm. So we have some randomized algorithm, which may use its, the same randomness uh, to answer different queries. And the querier might try to break uh, the correctness of this algorithm. And the big goal is, can we achieve uh, both efficient and robust uh, algorithms? So the algorithmic paradigm we're going to look at in the talk is that of a linear sketch. Um, linear sketches have many applications, compressed sensing, data streams, uh, distributed computation, numerical linear algebra, etc. And the basic idea behind th these is that you have your data and you want to perform a small number of linear measurements uh, on this data. Now, what does that mean? Uh, more formally, you have some large data vector, x, in r to the n. And you try to um, squish it down by applying a linear map a, chosen from some distribution, which is usually uh, independent of the data vector. You compute your sketch, y equals ax, which is in r dimensions. And typically, r is much smaller than the original um, <coughs> n-dimensional space. And then you output some function, um, some arbitrary function uh, of, of this sketch vector y. OK. And what does correctness uh, mean? So typically, people prove uh, a so-called for each uh, correctness. And it's the following. So for each uh, input data vector x, uh, the probability over a randomly chosen uh, sketching matrix A that the algorithm succeeds is at least 1 minus 1 over poly n. So high probability. OK. A natural question is, does this imply correctness on many inputs? Can the sketch be used to answer many queries? Um, and uh, this is true only under a modeling assumption. Uh, for instance, if the inputs are non-adaptively chosen, then by a simple union bound, we can just say that the algorithm is correct on a polynomial uh, number of them. However, what happens if, say, the input x2 depends on the output of the algorithm uh, for an earlier input, x1? Now we can't apply this union bound. In fact, there's no guarantee in this case that the algorithm will still be correct. And I think uh, a good example um, <clears throat> uh, to see why uh, the algorithm, uh, a classical sketch, will fail is, uh, is, is to look at the johnson lindenstrauss sketch. So what is that? So here the goal is to estimate, es estimate the Euclidean norm of your input vector x, or equivalently the squared Euclidean norm, from the squared Euclidean norm of the sketch ax. So one way of doing this, and there are many ways of doing it, is to uh, use a so-called johnson lindenstrauss sketch, which goes back to the johnson lindenstrauss lemma. And one formulation of this uh, says that if A is a k by n matrix of IID normal random variables with mean 0 and variance 1 over k, then provided the number of rows of this matrix A, um, which is k, is just a, bit, uh, just a little bit larger than log n, then you already have this very strong uh, for each correctness guarantee, namely the probability over this choice of matrix A that uh, the Euclidean norm of AX is within a constant factor of the Euclidean norm of X is at least 1 minus 1 over poly n. OK, so it succeeds on poly n non-adaptively chosen inputs. However, there's a very simple uh, attack to this sketch, which only makes one uh, adaptive query. Um, and it's the following. 
So the algorithm, what it does, is it queries uh, the input vector x equals ei for the ith standard uh, uh, basis vector. And it also queries x equals ei plus ej for the sum of two standard basis, basis vectors. And it does this for all i and j. Now, what does the uh, attacker learn from the output of the sketch? Well, by definition of the sketch, um, when I apply it to EI, I learn the squared Euclidean norm of the ith column of A. And when I apply it to EJ, I learn the squared Euclidean norm of the jth column of A. And when I apply it to EI plus EJ, I learn the squared Euclidean norm of AI plus AJ. But now I can just solve an equation with these three quantities to learn the inner product of the ith column and the jth column of the sketching matrix. OK, so now consider the matrix A transpose A. What do the entries of this matrix look like? Well, they all have the form inner product AI AJ for two columns of A, all of the entries. So I know the entire matrix A transpose A. And in particular, this matrix has the same kernel as the matrix A. So I learned the kernel of the sketching matrix A. If I know the kernel of the sketching matrix, then I, what I can do is just the following. I query a vector x, which is in the kernel of the sketching matrix. On the one hand, this is a non-zero vector, so it has non-zero norm. On the other hand, the output of the sketch will be zero, since it's in the kernel. So it can't achieve a relative error. So there's just one adaptive query here. Already shows that Johnson Lindenstrauss sketches uh, do not uh, tolerate um, adaptively chosen inputs. OK. And I want to uh, stress that correlations, they arise in nearly any uh, realistic setting. So um, there's sort of the natural or harmless um, model where Say you're using a, a, um, a, a network traffic monitor, uh, you're using a sketch, and you're deciding where to send traffic based on the output of the sketch, and that, that traffic might you know, become a future input at some point. And so the question here of robustness is, can we prove correctness on this distribution? But there's also a much more adversarial uh, example where there's sort of a denial of service attack on the network. And now someone is sort of actively trying to reroute packets uh, by looking at the output of the sketch and trying to fool it. And here the robustness question is, can we thwart the attack? So in this talk, what we're going to show is uh, strong impossibility results for um, algorithms uh, for which you can uh, adaptively choose inputs. And uh, to uh, formally state the theorem, let me introduce uh, uh, a problem uh, that we come up with, which is the gap norm problem uh, parameterized by some parameter b. And it's a promise problem, and it states the following. Given a vector x in r to the n, you want to decide if you're in a yes case, meaning the squared 2 norm of x is at least this parameter b, or you're in a no case, meaning the squared 2 norm is at most 1. And if you're not in either case, the output can be uh, either yes or no. And we're going to show impossibility for this very basic problem. And I should note that this problem is actually very easily solvable um, in this for each model of correctness that I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, you can solve it uh, for b equals 1 plus epsilon using a sketch with log n over epsilon squared rows using the johnson lindenstrauss uh, lemma. So this provides a strong uh, uh, separation. And the main result is as follows. Uh, for every parameter b, if you're given Oracle access to the linear sketch, and the linear sketch only uses slightly non-trivial uh, dimension, so its number of rows um, is n minus the log factor, then, uh, I mean, is at most n minus the log factor, then we can find in time polynomial in the number of rows and this parameter b a distribution on inputs for which the sketch fails uh, with high probability to solve the gap norm problem. 
Um, the attack is efficient. It's polynomial in the number of uh, rows. So this in particular rules out cryptographic solutions which might place uh, um, time bounds on the attacker. And it applies even to slightly non-trivial sketching dimension, right? So if I have n dimensions, I of course uh, can't break the sketch because it can uh, store the input vector exactly. Um, since uh, Euclidean norm is related up to a polynomial factor to any LP norm, we get the same uh, result for any LP norm. And moreover, the same result uh, holds even if the, uh, the function being applied to the sketch vector AX is a randomized uh, function. I mean, the sketch is, is fixed, but the function uh, can use randomness. Okay. Um, one other application of our result is to compress sensing. Um, so this is the L2, L2 sparse recovery problem. The problem is as follows. Uh, given an input vector x, you would like to output a vector x prime for which the distance between x and x prime is at most c times the Euclidean norm of x sub tail of k. What does that mean? It means I take my vector x, I take its top k coefficients in magnitude, and I replace them with zeros. So in particular, if, um, if x is, uh, only has k non-zero entries, then x will equal x prime. And in general, the closer x is to a k-sparse vector, the better the error is. And applying our uh, theorem uh, for gap norm, we can show for this problem there's no linear sketch with uh, fewer than n over c squared rows which can guarantee the L2, L2 sparse recovery problem with approximation factor C on a polynomial number of adaptively chosen inputs. And um, I should mention that this is actually uh, tight, at least for, uh, for small values of K. Uh, you can actually achieve N over C squared um, uh, using deterministic uh, uh, sketching matrices. Um, I also want to note that this is uh, uh, in the for each model of correctness, you can do much better. You can achieve uh, a number of rows which is only k log n over k uh, to get the same guarantee. Um, there are some positive results uh, for this problem um, and work with Anna, uh, Hemingway, Strauss, and, and Wooters. Um, you can get some upper bounds, but uh, they rely on assumptions uh, that can't be realized by a linear sketch. In particular, one assumption is that the norm of the input vector x is known exactly which is what we're going to show is not, uh, not possible. Okay, so um, the outline of the talk, um, I'm going to go over a sketch of a proof of this theorem for gap norm. And it's uh, proved using a linear algebraic uh, reconstruction attack, uh, which I'll go into. I won't have time to discuss the sparse recovery result, uh, but it follows uh, by reduction uh, from this gap norm problem and uh, if you're interested in it, I encourage you to look at the paper. Um, okay, so to, uh, um, to give a proof of this theorem, let's first formally define this computational model of a linear sketch. So an R-dimensional linear sketch can be viewed as follows. It can be viewed as any function f from Rn to, uh, in this case, to 0, 1. So a 0 would be if I'm in a no instance for gap norm, and a 1 if I'm in a yes instance. And the function satisfies the following, that for every x in Rn, f of x is equal to f of the projection of x onto a subspace u, which is r dimension. So we can identify this sketch with, with some r dimensional uh, subspace uh, u. Now, why does this capture a, um, a general linear sketch? Well, as I said earlier, a, a general linear sketch has the form um, a times x. And so, what, I mean, ax and u transpose x are equivalent if, you transpose if the rows of u transpose span the same space as the rows of a, because I can always uh, left multiply by a change of row basis. So for any uh, U transpose with the same row space, these two sketches are equivalent. I can go from one to the other. So in particular, I can choose U transpose to have orthonormal rows. And at that point, the sketch U transpose X is equivalent to the, to the sketch 
of the projection of x onto u because that has the form u u transpose x. And I can go from one to the other by left multiplying by u or u transpose. Okay, so this is just a convenient way of viewing a linear sketch as identifying it with some uh, subspace uh, u uh, that's r dimensional. And um, since we're going to be proving impossibility results, we're going to allow this uh, function f to have unbounded computational power on top of, uh, so what it sees is the projection of x onto u, and it can do whatever it wants. I mean, we're going to be proving an impossibility result, so our, our result is only stronger. But probably, for real applications, you'd want f to be efficient. OK, so the um, reconstruction attack uh, is as follows. So as input, you're given Oracle access to this uh, sketching function f using some unknown subspace u of r dimensions. And your goal is to try to reconstruct this subspace u. OK. So uh, we initialize uh, v sub 0 to be the 0 vector, a subspace of 0 dimension. And this is what we start off knowing about this unknown subspace u. And we're going to update this throughout the course of the algorithm. So for, for t equals 1 to t equals r iterations, what we do is the following. Um, we have three meta steps. The first step is a correlation finding step. And I'll go over all of these more on the next few slides. But the correlation finding step, what its job is to do is to find vectors, x1 through xm, which are in some sense weakly correlated with this unknown subspace u. And what that's going to turn out to mean is that the projection onto the subspace u is a little bit larger uh, in magnitude than, uh, than a random vector's projection onto u would be. We're going to try to find these vectors. Moreover, these vectors x1 through xm, um, they're going to be orthogonal to what we already know about the uh, subspace. So v sub t minus 1 starts off at v0. We know the 0 vector is inside of it. And we're slowly learning a basis for this unknown subspace u. And we ensure that we're always orthogonal to what we already know. The next step is a boosting step. So we have all these vectors, x1 through xm, which are weakly correlated with this unknown subspace. And what we want is a single vector, x, which is very strongly correlated with u. And you can think of that as meaning as actually contained inside of this subspace u. And moreover, it's orthogonal to what we already know. And finally, uh, there's a progress step. So what we do uh, is we update what we know. Uh, we set v sub t to be the span of v sub t minus 1 together with this new vector x. And after our iterations, we output the subspace v sub r. And the hope is that v sub r equals u. If that's the case, then if we know the subspace, we can query something in the kernel of the subspace. And we can break the algorithm. Um, for the same reason this johnson Strauss sketch was broken. Uh, we won't exactly uh, learn the subspace u. We'll get uh, a, a space vr which is very close to the subspace u, and that will be uh, sufficient. OK, so let me go through these steps. The first step is a um, correlation finding step. For this step, what we do is we prove a conditional um, expectation lemma. So the lemma is as follows. Um, given a d-dimensional sketch f, and now I'm using this variable d uh, because uh, you can think of the sketch as changing its dimension throughout the course of the algorithm. It starts off as an r-dimensional sketch, and we're slowly learning uh, basis vectors in it and reducing its dimension. So just given an arbitrary d-dimensional sketch f, what we can do is finding, using poly d queries, we can find an input distribution g such that the following holds. The expectation of the length of g projected onto u squared condition on the output of the sketch being 1 is slightly larger than without this conditioning. It's slightly larger than the expected length uh, of g projected onto u squared um, at, um, without the conditioning by an additive delta. So delta is our advantage over random. Um, and uh, moreover, this uh, delta is not going to be too small. It's going to be uh, polynomial 
in 1 over d, the sketching dimension. And actually, our query distribution, our attacking distribution, is very simple. Um, it's a Gaussian uh, uh, input. So um, it's IID Gaussian. N coordinates, each one has mean 0. And the variance is sigma on each of these uh, uh, coordinates. And uh, moreover, um, this sigma is going to be a, a, the main, what we're going to do is we're going to choose this sigma carefully, which is uh, unknown to the sketching algorithm. If the sketching algorithm knew sigma, it could output sigma times n, for instance. OK, so um, just a simplification. Um, if g is Gaussian, then uh, the projection of g onto this space u is also Gaussian uh, with this covariance matrix. So what we can think of is the query distribution as choosing a random Gaussian vector inside this unknown subspace u. This is uh, just for notational simplicity. So in this talk, we're going to drop the projection operator and just think of our query distribution as choosing a Gaussian in this unknown uh, subspace. OK, so the three-step intuition is as follows. So the queries are random Gaussian inputs g. So you have spherical symmetry. There's some unknown variance to them. But what does the sketch learn about the query distribution, which is parameterized by this variance? Well, everything it learns, it learns from this norm of the input, uh, I mean, of the query uh, ve vector g. Because the direction doesn't matter. It's a spherically symmetric uh, distribution. So what it learns about the variance uh, follows from the norm of this, uh, this query vector g. OK. And the next step. Uh, is an averaging step. So the idea is that if the norm is uh, larger than expected, intuitively the sketch is more likely to output 1. Uh, why is this? Well, we know by correctness if the norm is very large, if you're solving the gap norm problem, you should be outputting 1. If the norm is very small, you should be outputting 0. Um, so the intuition is that if it's larger than expected, you should output 1. It's not quite true, but um, via an averaging argument, We'll show it's true in a certain sense. And finally, um, again, uh, intuitively, uh, by a sort of Bayes rule, I can uh, reverse this conditioning. So instead, if I condition on the output of the sketch being 1, then the expectation of this norm is likely to be larger. And that's the goal for the conditional expectation lemma. Condition on the output being 1, the expectation is likely to be larger. OK. so. Um, let me go through this uh, more formally. So define this uh, uh, function p of s to be the probability that the uh, um, sketch outputs 1 on input uh, vector y, where we condition on the squared uh, Euclidean norm of y to equal s. Then we have the following uh, simple property for an input Gaussian vector g. If it has expected squared norm t, then we can just compute the probability that the sketch outputs 1 on this uh, input g. What is it? What's the integral over all possible input norms, uh, 0 to infinity, uh, s, of uh, nu sub t of s? Now, this is the uh, density of the chi-squared uh, uh, distribution. So um, the expectation is t, because it's just a sum of d uh, squared normal random variables. And we've chosen its expectation to be t. So what we do is, this is the density function, the probability that uh, the input uh, has square 2 norm s. And then um, it's a random uh, spherically symmetric uh, input. So then p of s, if I multiply by p of s, uh, which is the probability the sketch outputs 1 given a vector of that norm, then I exactly get the probability the sketch outputs 1. OK. So. It's useful to uh, consider the following plot. On the y-axis, we're going to plot this function p of s that I just uh, defined. On the x-axis, we're going to plot this squared uh, norm s. OK, so p of s is a probability. It's between 0 and 1. The norm s can be from 0 to infinity, but we're sort of mo most interested in looking at the range uh, 1 to b. This is the gap norm range. And what do we know by correctness? Well, as I said, by correctness, when the norm is very small, uh, the uh, 
P of s should be zero because you know it should solve the uh, the problem for most uh, vectors of small norm. When the norm is very large, P of s should be one. This is just correctness. Now the main question is uh, what goes on uh, in between these two extremes. So who knows? I mean. In a very nice world, we get this linear interpolation uh, between these two extremes. Um, that would be a very nice sketch, but there's no reason the sketch needs to behave this way, right? The sketch can get its own very accurate estimation to the input norm. And if it notices it's not near 1 and b, it can do whatever it wants inside of this range. Um, for instance, once the norm is slightly larger than 1, it might all of a sudden always output 1. Or it might not even be monotonic. I mean, it might, it might look like this. But we really can't rule out what the sketch is doing in between 1 and b. OK. But what we can do uh, using a probabilistic method uh, type argument is show that there exists some t, so that if I query a Gaussian distribution uh, with expected square 2 norm t, then I do have this following property. Now, this property is not enough for the conditional expectation lemma. Um, but uh, what it says is the following. It says that if I look at all uh, norms uh, to the right of this t, if I look at the probability that the sketch outputs 1 integrated uh, to the right of t, so this is the integral over s of the chi-square distribution with mean t uh, evaluated at s times p of s for t uh, going from t to infinity. And if I also look at this probability on the left of this uh, expectation t, then these two probabilities differ by an additive delta. So that's kind of close to a conditional expectation lemma. I mean, it means if I choose this, this, uh, this expectation t, then um, I'm slightly, uh, uh, I mean, the probability that I output 1 if I'm on the right is slightly larger than the probability I output 1 if I'm on the left. That doesn't really give you the uh, conditional expectation lemma, though, because you could have a pathological case where sort of um, all of the mass, even though this probability is larger, um, all of the, uh, uh, the norms are, are very close on the right to the expectation, but on the left they're very far uh, from the expectation. And so what we really would like to show is that this, given that the sketch outputs 1, this expected uh, projection length is larger than t, plus delta. And this doesn't immediately follow from uh, this probabilistic statement. So we need to do a little bit more work. Uh, and uh, what, I, um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, what I want to call uh, sliding, look at sliding chi-square distributions. Yeah. Um, no, so sigma very small, like less than one, or square. But I mean, you might. Oh, yeah. So there has to be some reasonable probability that this sketch actually outputs one. This is another condition that we can show for this choice of t. So I gloss that under the rug. That actually, you want to find the t not only so that this conditional expectation lemma holds, but also that. Uh, the probability that the sketch outputs 1, given that value of t, is at least 1 over poly d. Because we're actually going to need a sample from this distribution. Yeah. You caught me, so I tried to hide that. Um, OK, so to prove this uh, conditional expectation lemma, um, we're going to look at uh, sliding chi-square distributions. So what does this mean? So for each possible input, uh, squared input norm s, we're going to define a quantity delta of s. And what it's going to do is it's going to integrate over all uh, possible chi-square distributions um, with mean between 1 and t. And um, uh, so the chi-square distribution, the mean is going to be, oh, sorry, between 1 and b. And what we do is we have this input norm s. And, and one of these uh, sums in the integrand, one of these terms of the integrand uh, will correspond to some chi-square distribution, vt of s. And what we do is we multiply the weight of s under that chi-square distribution with the, the sine distance from s uh, to the mean. So s minus t 
times the density of S under this chi-square distribution uh, with mean t. Okay, so I think probably this is best explained uh, with a picture. So what we have is uh, a bunch of chi-square distributions here, uh, parameterized by different means, uh, t equals 1, 2, et cetera. Uh, the yellow is a uh, chi-square distribution with mean 1. Then I get a chi-square distribution with mean 2, this green. And so what you can see is that the chi-square distribution, not only is the, the mean growing, but the variance is also growing as theta t. It's, 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 it's fattening out. And why don't we just look at delta of 4, s equals 4. And why don't we look at the contribution from uh, the chi-square distribution with mean 2 and the chi-square distribution with mean 6. So when I plug in s equals 4 and t equals 2, I'll get a, a 4 minus 2, a 2, scaled by the density of 4 under the chi-square distribution with mean 2. And sort of symmetrically, what I'll get is uh, when I plug in s equals 4 and t equals 6, I'll get a minus 2, scaled by the density of, um, uh, of 4 under the distribution with mean 6. So the 2 and the minus 2, um, you know, you might hope things cancel to 0. This is where uh, uh, the point 4 lies on the density function for t equals 2. OK. Now, this is where the point 4 lies on the density function for t equals 6. It's larger. And this is basically because the variance is, uh, is, is spreading out. So what that means is this 2 gets multiplied by something smaller than the minus 2 got multiplied by. And so basically what this means is that delta s is almost always negative, except when s gets very large. S gets close to this uh, boundary B, or, or much larger than B. S can go to infinity, but um, delta S is mostly negative. Now, um, another interesting property here, though, is actually if you integrate delta S over all possible values of S, you actually get 0. Um, the reason is, so I just plug in this expression for delta of s in the integral is given here. And if I integrate with respect to s first, then what I'll get is uh, s times the density of a chi-square distribution. That's just the expectation if I integrate over all s. So I get t. t minus t, this becomes 0. And so this integral of delta s over all s is actually 0, even though delta s is, uh, is, is uh, negative uh, for most values of s that are small and positive for, for large values of s. Um, so they cancel and you get zero. And um, via some calculations, if we were in a, a very uh, um, nice world and this zero were one over poly d instead, um, we'd be done. Um, you have to believe me on that. Um, uh, but so how can we? So one thing we haven't used so far is correctness of the algorithm. So recall that p of s is the probability that f of y equals 1 given a uniformly random input vector with squared to norm s. And the correctness condition is for small s, p of s is about 0. And for large s, p of s is about 1. OK. So now let's look at that integral again. It evaluated as 0. But let's also put a p of s inside of the integral, p of s times delta of s. Now what's going to happen? When s is really small, we said delta of s is negative. And p of s is 0 by correctness when s is very small. So p of s times delta of s, I'm zeroing out some negative contribution to the integral. On the other hand, when s is very large, delta of s is positive. And p of s is also 1 in that case. I'm reinforcing some positive contribution to this integral. So actually, this integral um, is no longer 0 if I put it in a p of s there. It's a little bit larger. It's d. And via some calculations, um, uh, you can just show that this implies that uh, the conditional expectation lemma. Namely, by averaging, there exists a choice of mean uh, t, 
so that the expected uh, 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 value condition on the sketch outputting 1 is a little bit larger than t. So um, that's the conditional expectation lemma. Um, the next step is a boosting lemma. So we want to find a single vector x which is very strongly correlated with this unknown subspace u. And the idea is as follows. So we found this input distribution for which we can sample poly d vectors and get this slight bias. When the sketch outputs 1, uh, my length, the length of my projection onto u is a little bit larger than expected. So what I do is I take all those input vectors for which the sketch outputted 1 on that distribution, and I arrange them into a matrix. So I take poly d samples. I have a matrix with poly d rows and n columns. And now, it turns out that the top right singular vector of this matrix is extremely correlated with this unknown subspace u. So what I got is all these x1 through xms, which are a little bit correlated with this unknown subspace u. And I sort of aggregated their correlations by computing this top right singular vector, which is very close to being contained in the subspace u. Namely, we can show that the length of its projection onto the subspace is at least 1 minus uh, poly 1 over d. I mean, the intuition here is that the, um, for, for vectors which have a large component in the orthogonal uh, space to u, um, they're, uh, they're unbiased by the, the sketch outputting 1, because the sketch has no information about vectors that are orthogonal to, uh, uh, to its subspace. So um, basically, there exists a good, uh, a good vector uh, in the subspace, which is correlated with all these vectors. That follows by the conditional expectation lemma. And any vector which is far from the subspace um, would not uh, uh, be correlated with as many of these vectors um, as largely as that vector, basically because the sketch doesn't, ha doesn't have any information about the orthogonal complement. OK, so uh, yeah, so the proof is just um, we do a net argument, and we use a turnoff bound. This is where we needed the expectation in the conditional expectation lemma. It wasn't enough just to get a bias in probability. OK, so um, there are a few uh, details left to the algorithm. Um, uh, the, the algorithm can actually be implemented in poly r time, where r is the number of rows of the sketching matrix. Um, as I described it, it would actually be poly n time. But uh, there's no reason to use all n dimensions if you can break the sketch uh, by using only the first r plus a logarithmic uh, number of dimensions. So basically, you can take your r by n matrix and just restrict it to the first uh, r plus o log uh, nb columns and uh, put zeros on the remaining coordinates of your queries. And so this effectively makes this uh, matrix m an r by order r matrix. And uh, now the singular value decomposition is efficient. Uh, in terms of the number of uh, rows of the sketch. Um, and so basically, the reason the iteration works, uh, the reason the overall algorithm works, uh, is the following. So in an intermediate uh, step in the algorithm, what you're doing is you're querying a Gaussian vector orthogonal to what you've already uh, learned about the uh, unknown subspace. And intuitively, each step uh, in the iteration reduces the sketching dimension by 1. And after all iterations, the sketch has no dimensions left. On the other hand, your query space still has at least n minus r dimensions. And so this is effectively why you can query something in the kernel of, this, uh, of the sketch and, and, uh, and give a distribution for which the sketch fails. Um, there is one problem, which is actually you don't actually learn the unknown subspace u exact, exactly. Um, this is because it's very hard to find a vector which is exactly contained in the unknown subspace. Um, you just get something close to it. So as you iterate, the sketch technically still has r dimensions. Um, you can fix this by adding a small amount of Gaussian noise to all of the n coordinates. And then the sketch can't tell if you're querying a low-dimensional subspace plus Gaussian noise versus something very close to a low-dimensional subspace plus Gaussian noise. Um, so that's the uh, algorithm. Uh, and we've, uh, we've gone through all the steps. So just some open problems. Um, 
We didn't optimize the polynomial dependence. It's not clear how many polynomial uh, adaptive queries one can uh, uh, achieve with an upper bound. Um, you know, maybe for some applications, if you can achieve uh, slightly more than a linear number of queries, uh, this would already be, uh, be useful. Um, in general, if you need C adaptive queries uh, for your application, when can you do better than just independently repeating the sketch C times and using uh, uh, each of those sketches, uh, I mean, using each sketch once for each query? So uh, I think it, uh, this is an area which is sort of overlooked in a lot of sketching uh, results. Um, and I think uh, uh, there are a lot of open questions here. So that's all. Thank you. Well, if you have a deterministic sketch that works for all vectors, then it, it handles, uh, of course, it handles adaptive queries. And that, that's how you get this upper bound for uh, L2, L2 sparse recovery. I said this, we can show an n over c squared lower bound um, on the number of uh, rows you need for any adaptive algorithm. You can actually get a, a matching uh, algorithm by using a deterministic sketch, uh, I think, uh, developed by Anna and uh, many others. Uh, um, yeah, but for the L2 problem, there is no deterministic uh, sketch with fewer than uh, n rows. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can actually just query something in the kernel. Uh, what, what you end up finding is a distribution over inputs on which the, uh, the algorithm typically fails. So on most of the inputs, the algorithm will fail. Um, so, I mean, you can't actually query something directly in the kernel. Uh, you don't actually learn the kernel exactly. But it, so, it, so what we prove is that you find a distribution for which you typically uh, output the wrong answer. Linear sketch plus. Oh, um, yeah, linear sketch for, for, certain, for certain other problems, yeah. If you have the length and you have a linear sketch, maybe you can get upper bounds for some other problems. Yeah, that would be a good question. Yeah. No, you're just getting, all you're getting is a bit, zero or one, which, so, so basically you're not getting, you're certainly not getting the sketching matrix A, and you're not getting Y equals A times X either. All you're getting is the output of the function, which will say, so, so the function looks at the sketch Y equals A times X, and it decides via its own thoughts if it should output zero or one, and you see that output zero or one, and that's all you see. Yeah, this is a strong, I mean, this, this is a, you get less information this way, and so it's a stronger lower bound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>